Welcome everyone to today's webinar in the NIEHS Exposure Science and Exposure Webinar Series, sponsored by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. This is a continued effort by NIEHS to advance our mission by fostering a public discussion on the science of exposure and its impact on human health. Today is our first webinar in the year of 2017, and we're happy that you are able to join us. I'm Yu Xiaoqi from the NIEHS. It's my pleasure to moderate today's webinar for you. As usual, the webinar is a webcast. If you encounter technical difficulties or have questions for the speaker during the presentation, please email exposom at nihs.nih.gov. I will be, moder I will be mo uh, monitoring the email during the presentation. At the end, there will be a discussion utilizing your questions. Today's speaker is Dr. Mariana Figueroa. Dr. Figueroa is the director of the Light and Health Program at the Lighting Research Center and a professor at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. She has over 20 years of experience in a study of human light interactions and serves as PI on multiple research grants investigating the effect of light on, he on human health the reading, um, photobiology, and the lighting are older for older adults. Dr. Figueroa is a fellow of the Illuminating Engineering Society of the IES and the chair of the IES Committee on Light and Human Health. She has published more than 70 scientific articles in her uh, field of research. The title of Dr. Figueroa's presentation is light and its impact on circadian disruption and health, what we know, what we don't know, and what we need to know. Mariana, the podium is yours. Thank you very much, um, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, I will start uh, just giving a brief outline of what I'm going to try to cover in the next hour. Uh, basically give a general overview of light's relationship uh, with circadian rhythms. Um, and talking a little bit about light at night as an endocrine disruptor, uh, basically giving an overview of, of what we know on that. Um, talk a little bit about the issues and the uncertainties. Um, and, and in particular, I think we, we should be thinking about individual differences and, and individual um, sensitivities to light, um, as well as um, why isn't that we haven't um, establish that direct link between light circadian disruption and health risks. Uh, there's some indirect link from animal studies and epidemiological research, but there isn't really a, a direct link. And I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the issues that we need to consider to try to forge that link. And then finally, um, what we need to know in terms of um, what are the studies and how can we approach the problem, I think, together as a community to try to further the field in, in, in that regard. So I'll give just a general um, overview. I'm sure many of you um, that are logged in uh, know about it, but just as a general overview of what circadian rhythms are, these are uh, biological rhythms that plants and animals exhibit. Uh, these are behavioral and physiological changes that occur over an approximately 24 hours, and these repeat over successive days. So circa is about, D is a day. Um, circadian rhythms are generated and regulated endogenously, so we have a biological clock in the suprachiasmatic nuclei in the hypothalamus of the brain that will generate and regulate these circadian rhythms. Um, if we are in a dark cave, and we have absolutely no access to the external environment, we're going to continue to have circadian rhythms. The difference is that these rhythms are going to run in humans with a period slightly greater than 24 hours. On average, it's about 24.2 hours. So basically, we would be daily out of sync uh, with the local time on Earth or with our watch. So light or light-dark patterns reaching the back of the eye are the primary synchronizer of circadian rhythms to the local position on Earth. More specifically, every day when we get up and we get light, so if we go for a half an hour walk every morning, we are going to reset our biological clock so that it runs with a period of 
24 rather than 24.2 hours, and that maintain us entrained with the local time on Earth. When we travel multiple time zones, it's going to be the light-dark patterns at destination that will slowly reset the timing of our biological clock to allow us to be awake during the daytime at destination and to be asleep during the nighttime at destination rather than um, at where we first started our trip. However, um, light, if we don't get enough light or if we get too much light at the wrong time, light can also be a major disruptor. And that is really what we're going to be talking about here today is light as an endocrine disruptor and how do we better understand and better control to avoid that. Um, Before I get into that, um, uh, to be quite honest, when I first started putting together the presentation, my first question is, well, what does light or light-dark patterns have to do with exposome? Uh, First, I had to learn what exposome was. I know many of you know, and for me, it was a new uh, term. And, you know, exposome is defined as an individual's lifetime exposures and how those exposures would affect health. Um, And obviously, an individual's exposure can begin even before birth, and it will include all environmental and occupational insults that are experienced by a person over his or her lifetime. Um, What's one thing that we are exposed over our lifetime, whether we want it or not? Sunrises and sunsets, right? Sunrises occurs every morning and it sets every night and there is nothing we can do about it. So it's an environmental um, issue that we have to deal with daily. But on top of it, we all have light switches. And electric lighting also is something that now we are exposed to and we need to be able to control and expose to it at the right time so we can avoid any issues with circadian disruption. And in fact, the fact that we now have light at night, um, it has been implicated as what we call endocrine disruptor because one of the hypotheses, obviously we do know now that it can suppress the the nocturnal production of the hormone melatonin. And as I will cover in a minute, melatonin has oncostatic effect and has been shown to be associated with growth rate of tumors. Um, And As I mentioned, light exposure at the wrong time can induce circadian disruption. So it makes perfect sense that we consider light-dark pattern as sort of a exposome and we should be measuring light-dark patterns in exposomics or in the study of, of exposomes. So let me start with this idea of light at night being an endocrine disruptor and affecting health. This was really uh, postulated in 1987. Richard Stevens um, put forward what we call the melatonin hypothesis. And at the time, uh, the hypothesis was that the suppression of melatonin by light at night and by electromagnetic fields or EMFs was hypothesized to increase production of estrogens in the ovaries, which in turn would stimulate the turnover of breast epithelial stem cells and thereby would increase the likelihood of cancer. So that was sort of the the overarching hypothesis and this really was an important um, piece of work because it really uh, led a lot of scientists to start studying this and start better understanding that possibility. With all these studies, Uh, I think the the field now has moved on to a little bit more broader concept, which is the concept of the circadian disruption hypothesis. So it's not just light at night and melatonin suppression, but it's really the disruption of circadian rhythms that it could be by light at night or it could be by other behavioral um, um, issues. And that has been associated not just with breast cancer, as the original hypothesis was, but also with other diseases such as diabetes and obesity, um, cardiovascular disease, and other types of of cancer. So right now, I think the field is looking more into the circadian disruption hypothesis where light at night, acute melatonin suppression um, is a component of it. So in terms of the melatonin hypothesis, what we know... Um, from animal studies 
is that um, nocturnal concentrations of melatonin may slow down the rate of division of cells, reducing the growth rate of tumors. It may minimize invasive properties of cancer cell, reducing metastasis of tumors. And it may suppress the initiation of cancer by limiting DNA damage. So melatonin is really an important hormone. It's a hormone we produce at night in darkness, and it's known as sort of the darkness hormone because what it does, it tells the body it's nighttime. And it does seem to have antioxidant properties that helps with limiting DNA damage. So it is certainly a hormone that we shouldn't be disrupting. And unfortunately, exposure to certain types of light and I'll talk a little bit about that in, in the next slide, can seize and suppress the production of nocturnal melatonin. That's why we should avoid disrupting melatonin or exposing ourselves to these kinds of light. So this was work that was done by Dr. Uh, David Blass. He's now at Tulane University. And he did a series of studies, and this is just one of the, the work that he's done early on, uh, looking at melatonin's effect on tumor growth. So what he did is he removed the pineal gland of the animals. So these animals were not secreting melatonin anymore because they didn't have the pineal gland, which is a gland that secretes melatonin. And then after three days, he injected tumors in these animals. And then he split the animals into half of them received oral melatonin. He actually looked at oral melatonin in the morning and in the evening. And the other half didn't get anything. Um, and what he was able to show over the course of the week was that the growth rate of the tumors that did not have any oral, of the, with, in the animals that were not exposed to or did not receive any oral melatonin, especially those receiving oral melatonin in the evening, um, the growth rate of those receiving melatonin was much slower than those that did not receive melatonin. So basically, he clearly showed here that the addition of melatonin, even through oral melatonin, was important to minimize or to reduce the growth rate in certain types of tumors. In terms of humans, obviously, all we can do is uh, correlational studies and epidemiological studies. And there was one study showing um, something very interesting. They looked at various um, data that they have of nurses with, that were diagnosed with cancer and nurses that were not diagnosed with cancer, and they had their urine melatonin level, so it's their first morning void level, which gives them a total amount of nighttime melatonin production. And what they saw was that there was a lower risk of breast cancer in those who had higher melatonin levels irrespective of history of working night shift. So basically, there's a huge difference in how much melatonin each person naturally produces. And it seems like if you're one of the, the people that has a higher production of melatonin during the nighttime, you, a person seems to be more protected against breast cancer. And that sort of corroborates with the idea that melatonin is oncostatic and, and limits DNA, DNA damage and it's a good hormone to maintain high during the nighttime. So in summary, I think the literature does strongly suggest that melatonin has an oncostatic effect and prevents the growth rate of existing tumors. Uh, in terms of the circadian disruption hypothesis, as I mentioned, um, it has been, the studies have been beyond cancer. Um, and circadian disruption, which is really a misalignment of the light-dark patterns with your sleep-wake patterns or misalignment of, you know, peripheral oscillations with your master clock oscillation. So the disruption of circadian rhythms has been associated with poor sleep, poor performance, and higher stress. And honestly, all of us who go through one night of sleep deprivation, which is a misalignment. We maintain one night awake and we sleep during the day, like shift workers, for example. We know we're miserable the following day. But obviously, if you do that for one night and you're able to then go back to sleeping your normal nighttime, you can recover from that very easily. Now, if you continue to do that for many, many years, such as what shift workers do, 
you can have increased risk for more serious maladies like increased anxiety and depression, increased smoking, increased risk for cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes, as well as higher incidence of breast cancer and colorectal cancer and other types of cancer. So um, a lot of the studies that were done with animals looking at the impact of circadian disruption on health um, has been short-term studies, and this study was published last year or almost two years ago, and it really looked at the long-term health effects of circadian disruption. So now you're not talking about one night or, you know, a few weeks of disruption. You're really talking about long-term disruption. Um, this was done with um, animals that were um, breast cancer-prone animals, and they exposed them to either a regular light-dark cycle, which in the graph you see here on the right are the closed circles, or a weekly alternating light-dark cycle. So basically every week they were reversing their light-dark cycle. So one, one week they were daytime, the following week they, they were nighttime, the other week they were daytime or mimicking daytime and nighttime shifts. So they did that for many, many weeks. And what they show was that those that were exposed to this weekly alternating light-dark cycles, which is, again, the open circles, they had a significant increase in their body weight as well as a significant percentage of um, palpable tumors. So, in other words, they developed tumors faster than those that were exposed to normal light-dark cycles. So this study really show that circadian disruption may be directly linked to cancer initiation as well as other maladies. And if you do that for longer periods of time, and here you see that it's after 30 weeks that they start separating um, in terms of the effect. So it's showing that the long-term disruption is really something that one should avoid in terms of uh, the health impact. So in addition to the animal models, obviously, um, we try to collect data with humans. Uh, of course, we can't do the same types of studies that we do with animals and humans. So the best way to look into that question in humans is doing epidemiological studies. So one population um, that is used as sort of a surrogate for exposure to light at night and exposure to circadian disruption are shift workers especially those with nighttime work. And in general, um, the epidemiological studies do suggest an increase of breast cancer risk in long-term rotating shift workers. So if a person works 20 to 30 years on rotating shifts, that includes nighttime work, this person is about 1.2 to two times more effective, or more likely to um, have breast cancer later in life. Okay, so it's about twice between 1.2 and 2 the relative risk for it. However, there has been some recent meta-analysis that suggests that this relationship is weak. So they look back at some of the epidemiological evidence and they question um, some of that evidence. And based on the evidence for the, from the animal studies that we believe it's very strong, and based on more limited evidence from human epidemiological studies. In 2007, the International Agency for Research on Cancer classified shift work that involves circadian disruption as a probably carcinogenic to humans, not as a carcinogenic to humans. And the reason why they used probably was, again, because they felt that the epidemiological evidence was not as strong as the animal studies was. Of course, um, it makes sense that it's a lot harder to using epidemiological studies to be able to make that direct link because if you look at this graphic, um, shift work is really related to a lot of things, not just exposure to light at night, not just circadian phase shifting or circadian disruption, and not just sleep disruption. There are other factors that may be influencing or may be affecting um, shift workers, and there might be also some genetic uh, components. I mean, those 
that are doing shift work may be self-selecting themselves, uh, but it may be that the fact that they can put up with shift work or make them more susceptible to be impacted by the environment. I mean, we don't really know, but all we can say is it would be too simplistic to say it's simply the exposure to light at night because there are many other variables that need to be taken into account um, when we try to make that bridge between uh, shift work and health risk. Another, um, I think, way of trying to look at that relationship between light at night, circadian disruption, melatonin suppression, and health is, has been epidemiological studies um, using satellite photometry. And the satellite photometry is used as a surrogate for exposure to light at night. And some studies have shown that there's a positive correlation between light at night measured using satellite photometry or self-reports of room brightness and cancer risk. And these studies were really not looking at shift work, and in fact, some of them didn't even control for shift work. These were looking at the general population and trying to see if there was this correlation between satellite photometry and cancer risk. And when I talk about the uncertainties in a minute, I will talk about why we think this is probably not a good way to characterize light um, as a surrogate for exposure to light at night and, and circadian disruption. So just to summarize the current ideas, um, and this was a paper that was just published, uh, which it, it's, it's talking about um, light exposure effects on mood and, and brain circuits, but it also talks about as a general um, sort of like effect of light at night on circadian disruption uh, and health. So the whole idea is that we're now exposed to too much light, light during the evening or at night, uh, perhaps too little light during the day, which I'll show some data about that in a minute. And that light at night is acting as a disruptor of our behavioral and physiological rhythms, and that disruption is leading to all these different uh, maladies such as mood disorders, cardiovascular disease, impact on immune system, metabolism, stress, and so on. So let me just summarize, I think, what, what we know from the literature. Obviously, it's not an extensive uh, literature re review, but at least it's what a summary of what we have so far. We do know that light is the major synchronizer of circadian rhythms to the local time on Earth. Um, we know that animal studies suggest a strong relationship between light at night, melatonin suppression, circadian disruption, and health risk. Um, shift work, which is used as a surrogate for exposure to light at night, and its possible association with melatonin suppression and circadian disruption has been linked to increased risk for diseases such as cancer, diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. Um, especially with the cancer, uh, some of the recent meta-analysis suggests that that relationship is weak. So I think um, um, we probably want to see more on that in the, in the near future. And that the direct link between the light at night, melatonin suppression, circadian disruption, and health risk in humans are still under investigation. So we really haven't been able to make that direct link. We've been able to indirectly link these things, but not necessarily directly. And the question is why? I mean, or what can we do um, that we can perhaps strengthen that link or not, or at least learn a, bit, a little bit more about that relationship? Um, so I'm going to talk in details about what we think is are the issues and the uncertainties that we need to address in the future. One is uh, to specify and to measure the light stimulus as it might affect the circadian system. Uh, the other one is to be able to translate findings from nocturnal animals to humans, and I'll show you some data showing that nocturnal animals are much more sensitive to light um, than humans, so we have to take into account the absolute and the spectral sensitivities um, for being able to translate from animals to humans. Um, we need to use calibrated instruments to measure light for the circadian system. We need to measure the total light exposures, not just light at night, because one of the things 
So the emerging hypothesis is, are we getting too little light during the day? And it's not as much the light at night, but it's just that we are in circadian darkness during the day. Uh, we need to account for individual differences. And I will just touch very briefly that we talk a lot when we talk about light as a circadian disruptor. We talk a lot about blue light and light and melatonin suppression, and I think it's more than that, and I'll show you some data showing about that. So in terms of the first point, um, which is the need to specify and to measure the stimulus, um, we have been uh, here at the LRC for many, many years trying to understand lighting in terms of its characteristics. So it's the amount, it's the spectrum or the color of light, the distribution, the timing, and duration. And we need to understand how it affects the visual system because lighting, after all, is needed for us to be able to see and to perform visual tasks in the built environment. And even though sometimes the lighting for the visual system may conflict with the lighting for the non-visual systems, we still need to light the built environment to allow us to see. So that's something we can't forget. When you talk about the non-visual systems, that's when you think about lighting for face shifting or entrainment. So it's really the light as it may affect the biological clock, your timing of, of sleep, your time of hormone productions, um, your circadian alignment or misalignment, but you also have an acute alerting effect of light, similar to, say, a cup of coffee. And one of the things that we're learning with the research we're doing is that there might be some different parts of the brain that are responding to light, and the type of light that affects the face shifting is different than the type of light that affects the alerting effect. So... They can be the same, but it can also be different, and I think that's why we need to be able to measure and specify the stimulus and know what, what impact on the biological system we're trying to understand before just doing a general sweeping. It's light. Well, the question is, what is light? And that's really something important for us to think about. So in terms of the absolute and spectral sensitivities, and that's basically... Um, color and amount of light. Uh, we do know that the circadian system is a blue sky detector as measured by acute melatonin suppression and the, the change in the timing of your dim light melatonin onset or change in the timing of your sleep. Um, it's a peak sensitivity at around 460 nanometers. Uh, this is very different than the, the black curve that you see there, V lambda, which is the photopic luminous efficiency function, and that is the function that it's used to calibrate most of your light meters. So when you have a light meter and you measure lux in the environment, you are measuring the amount of optical radiation that is falling under this black curve. The circadian system has a peak sensitivity at much shorter wavelengths. It's the blue and the uh, red curves that you see there. Um, we do know now that we have a new class of photoreceptor in the retina called intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell, or IPRGC. Uh, that was discovered by David Burson in 2002, and it really was based on the work that was done by Russell Foster and colleagues in the early 1990s where they had uh, knockout mice that were basically blind animals. They had rods and cones that did not respond to light. Um, they would give these animals a pulse of light and these animals would change the timing of their activity um, in response to that light pulse. So it was clearly suggesting that there was something that was responding to that light. So obviously the first thought was, well, what about light through the skin or the skull? So they removed the eyes and there was no response. So clearly there was something in the eyes that was responding to that light. And then in 2002, David Burson found that last piece of the puzzle where he discovered these IPRGCs. Uh, these IPRGCs are the main conduit of light signals 
to the biological clock, from the retina to the biological clock. But they do receive input from the classical pho photoreceptors, which are the rods and cones. What's also interesting is that the IPRGC has a peak sensitivity at about 480 nanometers, and that's because they have melanopsin as the opsin that gives them the, its photosensitivity. Um, the circadian system has a peak sensitivity at 460 nanometers, which is shorter, which does strongly suggest participation of short wavelength cones. So the bottom line is that we use all three classes of photoreceptors, and what we did here at the Lighting Research Center, we developed a mathematical model where using the light spectrum, which is what energy, where on the spectrum that light is emitting optical radiation, so using the spectral power distribution of the light source and using light levels, we can actually calculate what we call circadian light or circadian effective light, which would be how that light is affecting the circadian system, okay? And then using that circadian light, we can then estimate the absolute sensitivity, which is the graph that you see on the right. So what this graph tells you, it tells you from threshold to saturation how a certain light, light source of a certain spectral power distribution and a certain light level will affect one outcome of the circadian system, which is acute melatonin suppression after one hour exposure. So if you look at, um, on the far left of that graph, you see outdoor light levels, outdoor night light levels. That's probably below threshold. So what you are exposed to outside, outdoors, it's too low of light level to affect the circadian system. So you're probably not impacting your circadian system when you're outdoors at night. When you're outdoors, obviously during the daytime, you are at saturation. And then when you're indoors, you tend to be at lower light levels at home and a little bit higher light levels in indoor office. But in general, you're around 300 lux at the eye if you get there. So you're around the middle of that graph here in terms of what, how much light you're being exposed to in the built environment. And we see in nursing homes and assisted living facilities, we work a lot with Alzheimer's patients, they are exposed to less than 100 lux all day long. So that's really my point about we may be exposed to too little light during the daytime more than saying that we're exposed to too much light during the evening, and that's something we have to think about. So. In order to test our ability to predict uh, the effect of the different light sources on acute melatonin suppression, we ran this study where we collected data with a warm color. This is more of a yellowish white color light source, and those are light emitting diodes or LEDs. We also looked at a cool light source, uh, 6400K or Kelvin temperature light source. And we collected data with these different light levels. So you'll see that the light levels are in lux level so that people can understand because we converted it to lux, but we really measured in circadian light or CLA, which is the x-axis that you see there. And we performed three studies collecting data on these different light sources. And this is not a curved fit to the data. This is actually the model a priori prediction. We predicted using the model that I showed in the previous slide, we predicted what the suppression would be. We then collected the data and we got very close. So the model is doing pretty well in predicting suppression, notwithstanding the, the size of these standard deviations, which shows a lot of individual differences. So there is absolutely no question that people will respond to light differently and that's something we have to keep in mind when we talk about light at night and its effect on health. But basically what we found is below 60 lux at the eye, we saw negligent suppression. Uh, when you start getting above 100 lux and certainly above 300 lux at the eye, you certainly see more significant suppression. Now, dose also matters. It's not just about light level. It's not just about spectrum. It's also about duration. So we showed here, this is a study we did looking at iPads. 
and how the iPads may affect your melatonin levels in the evening. Um, so we brought people to the lab over three weeks, um, once every week, and we exposed them to the iPads at full brightness, uh, to the iPad at full brightness, and we gave them blue light goggles. So we were giving them blue light because we knew that blue light was going to suppress the melatonin, or we gave them orange goggles. So the orange goggles was removing the blue light, and we exposed them to two hours of that light. So we basically collected melatonin levels in darkness first, then after one hour and after two hours of exposure. And what we found was after one hour exposure, we did see a significant reduction of melatonin concentration uh, with the blue light, which is what we expected because we designed the experiment to suppress melatonin with the blue light. But we did not see any significant suppression of the tablet compared to the orange-tinted glasses, which was used as sort of the negative control for the study. Well, after two hours, we did see a significant suppression. So sometimes you talk about amount and spectrum, but you also need to say for how long. Otherwise, you can't really say whether that light will or will not suppress melatonin. Also, as a sidebar, uh, we predicted a suppression of 3% after one hour exposure um, using our mathematical model. We actually achieved 3%, so we were able to, again, predict very well using the model. The other important point about dose is, you know, there, there has been people doing studies, including us, looking at adding or delivering light through closed eyelids while people are asleep um, for phase shifting the clock. And we have been able to show that, yes, you can suppress melatonin and you can phase shift the biological clock through closed eyelids while people are asleep. But you need a lot of light. Instead of 300 lux of light at the eye, you need 50,000 lux at the cornea to be able to get through your eyelids to have an effect. And I can tell you, 50,000 lux is what you get outdoors on a sunny day. You're not going to get that in your bedroom. Um, so when we talk about the impact of light on people, we need to, to remember that when you close your eyes, the nature is very nice because it protects you against disrupting your biological clock. It doesn't let blue light through. You have to really crank it up the light levels to be able to do that. Um, distance from the source matters. So a lot of people ask me about watching television. Well, if you're watching television, you're actually far away from the TV, and you tend to get a lot, a lot less light at the eye. And we showed here, we did a study where we exposed people to 90 minutes of watching TV. This was a 70-inch TV. It was a very, very large TV. They sat at 6 feet and 12 feet from the TV. Uh, 6 feet and 12 feet from the TV, and we did not see any significant suppression uh, from the television. And the reason is they were really getting very little amount of light. Even though the room looks bright because the TV was very good, very bright, it didn't reach enough light in the retina to suppress that melatonin. Now, the one thing that I also want to point out is that age matters. Uh, we have some data showing that teenagers with age between 15 and 17 years of age are much more sensitive to light than college kids or middle-aged adults. Uh, we did a study with self-luminous displays. Uh, on the first night, they were exposed to the self-luminous displays with the orange-tinted glasses, so it's like they weren't receiving any blue light. And then on the second night, without the orange-tinted glasses. And again, it was a two-hour exposure. And what we showed was that the suppression was much greater than what we predicted, um, suggesting that these kids are much more sensitive to light. So that's one thing to remember. And we have worked with um, the Russos at um, Fox Chase Cancer Center, and they do have a hypothesis that 
Um, breast cancer might be a childhood disease where you may insult, get an insult when you are in that age where you're transitioning from pre-puberty to post-puberty, and you can imprint that and you can express that later on in life. So it may be a matter of us paying attention of not exposing adolescents, especially young girls, for example, to an insult like that in, in their middle age. So that's sort of a hypothesis and something that I think might be worth pursuing as, as a study. Um, the other thing that is very important is the timing of exposure, okay? The same light in the morning will be good, but if you receive that same light in the evening, it will probably be detrimental. So talking about light exposure without talking about when you got that light is not complete information, okay? We do know that morning light or light after minimum core body temperature, which typically occurs about a couple of hours prior to your natural waking, will advance the timing of your sleep. So you're going to go to bed earlier the following night. Evening light delays the timing of your sleep. Now, one of the things that we have been learning from the study we're doing here is that every photon you receive during your waking hours counts. So these are data... Those two graphs are data we collected when we deliver an advancing or a delaying light scheme to subjects. And on the graph on the right, we only took into account the morning and the evening light exposures, which was our lighting intervention. On the left, we took into account their entire light exposure. And our ability to predict circadian phase shift is a lot better when we take into account the total light exposure. In addition to that, the amount of light you get during the day will set your sensitivity to light at night. So if you get too little light during the day, you're going to be more sensitive to light at night. That's what we call photic history. So we need to know all the light you get throughout your waking hours before we can talk about lighting being positive or negative for health. The second point I want to make is that mice and humans are different in many respects, but in particular when it comes to their absolute and spectral sensitivity to light for the circadian system. Nocturnal ro rodents are generally several orders of magnitude, three to 10,000 times more sensitive to light than humans. So the lighting we use in our animal facilities are like exposing animals to multiple suns. They are very, very bright lights. We don't know what the consequences of that is in terms of the results we're getting with our uh, experiments, but certainly we know that five lux of light for an animal is a lot brighter than five lux of light for humans. So when we're transitioning or translating the results from one to the other, we need to make sure we take that into account. So here's just an example of if you look at the x-axis, you have the photopic illuminance at the eye, so how much light you're getting with your light meter at the eye. And again, lux levels are not correct, but we converted that and then convert it back into lux levels. And then the y-axis, you have a relative response. And just to give you an idea on the top of this graph, you have the light levels that represent um, these photopic illuminances at the eye. So uh, white paper under 500 lux horizontal, which is typically what, it's, what is recommended by the Illuminating and Engineering Society for Offices. It's, it's the one in the middle. A white paper under moonlight is on the left. And then a light box that is typically used for seasonal affective disorder is the one on the right. So what you have here are three um, correlated color temperature light sources, um, a fluorescent light of a 3000K, which is a warmer color, a 4100K, which is a little bit cooler, and a 7500K. So as you increase the amount of short wavelength emitted by the light source, you do increase the response. So you need less light to have a response with a 7500K than you need, for example, with a 3000K. Um, blue LEDs, this is a 470 nanometer LED, so it's a blue light, it looks blue. You need a lot less light because you're maximally sensitive to blue light, so you don't need a lot of light to have a response. And then the green curve is your relative visual performance. That's really how you see, how you read black 
font on a white paper in offices. So you can navigate in the space and you can read at very, very low light levels, much lower than what the circadian system needs to be activated. And the, this one is the estimated phase shifting response to a 30-minute light pulse in a mouse. So as you can see, for phase shifting, your mouse is much more sensitive than for uh, human response when it comes to light for the circadian system. The other issue I would like to point out is the need to use calibrated instruments to measure light for the circadian system. So um, I mentioned about the work that the epidemiological studies looking at satellite images. And we don't think satellite images are a good surrogate for light at night as it impacts the circadian system. So as you can see here, the DMSB satellite, what it measures is that sort of dashed line, and it measures a lot of IR radiation or infrared radiation. So then what we do is we pass a filter. We call it the astronomical V-band filter. And what that filter does, it matches that uh, satellite um, image very close to V lambda, which is how our visual system, or one aspect of our visual system, which is reading a black font on a white paper, sees, which has that peak sensitivity at 555 nanometers. But that's still different than how our circadian system responds to light, which we are looking for short wavelength, peaking at 460 nanometers. So the light we're measuring with these satellite images are not light that is effective for the circadian system. So these are probably not good calibrated instruments for measuring light for the circadian system. So we have developed uh, what we call the decimeter. Uh, the decimeter was actually the first time we started developing was under a grant from the Department of Energy. That's why it's called decimeters, because it's supposed to measure the amount of daylight into the built environment. We then got a grant, we then worked with Dr. Eva Schoenhammer at, at uh, Harvard Public Health, working with the Nurses Health Study. Um, they were wearing some of these devices and we collected some data. I'll show you a little bit of that. And um, then Dr. Mark Ray here from the LRC got a grant from NIHS, from the GEI, where we really developed, uh, we further developed the decimeters. Um, we, the first started with it being developed trying to measure light close at, to the eye because that's where we want to know the exposures. Um, when we started working with they, uh, Alzheimer's patients uh, under an NIA grant, we realized that Alzheimer's patients, they were not going to be using this kind of device close to the eye, so compliance was very hard. So we then developed what we call the dime simeter, and we now call it decimeter D, which was sort of a pin and a pendant which was measuring calibrated light for the circadian system. So we measured red, green, and blue with this RGB data. We can then use our model and calculate circadian effective light and circadian stimulus. Um, and we now have been using this device in many cohorts measuring light exposures, and I'll show you uh, some of the data we have on that. So this was one of the earlier studies that we did um, looking at teachers, and the reason why we selected teachers is because they're very regular. Um, uh, they don't do shift work, and some of the, the, the studies that were done looking at satellite photometry and cancer risk included all populations and didn't correct for shift work. So we wanted to make sure we got regular people to avoid circadian disruption to be a factor. We asked them to wear the decimeters for seven days. And we also install decimeters in their windows and in their nightstands to be able to measure their circadian light that they were exposed to in their bedrooms as coming from outdoor lights or street lights. And we compare those field measurements with the sky brightness category. So that's what you see here uh, on the right. The little people there are where our subjects were located. Um, and the sky brightness, for those of you who are not familiar with, it gives sort of a, an idea of how bright that sky is based on that satellite photometry. So a blue one would be very dark, and then green, yellow, orange, red, and white, you increase the amount of that sky brightness. So what we found was there was absolutely no relationship between the nighttime light measurements inside the bedrooms and on the windows with sky brightness categories. 
Um, so the upper graphs are the median illuminances and circadian light. The bottom graph are the mean illuminance and circadian light. And then it didn't matter whether they were in a green or white region. We saw absolutely no relationship between that, meaning that behavioral is something we need to take into account. People will pull out the shades. They will draw curtains. They will make sure they don't have the light inside their bedrooms. Of course, I think we as society need to make sure we don't dampen a lot of light in people's bedrooms because that's annoying. Um, but we do know that people's behavioral will make sure that this gets away. I mean, I was in Iceland, and they have an issue of having almost 24 hours of daylight, and that's what they have to do in order to, to sleep. Um, the other key point that we learned early on was that we really needed to quantify circadian disruption in the field, not just light at night, Okay. Uh, so these are data that we have with rotating shift workers and with day shift workers, okay? And the upper one is the circadian light. The bottom one is the activity. And as you can see, if we're only measure, measuring light or only measuring activity, there's a lot of overlap between these two cohorts. So it would be very hard for us to figure it out how to solve that problem. So what we have proposed is a way of measuring circadian disruption that we call phaser analysis. So we really do cross-correlation between the input, which is the light and dark, and the output, which is the rest activity patterns, which we also can collect with the decimeter. And using that for seven days in a row, we can get uh, cross-correlation functions such as the graphs you see on the right. The upper one is for day shift. The lower one is for rotating shift. And you can see that there's a radical difference between these two. So the relationship between light, dark, and rest activity patterns is very different between these two groups. So this is what the phaser analysis is. is a, it gives you an idea of magnitude, which is the length of that vector. So an entrained person would have a long length, a long phaser magnitude, and a disrupted person would have a short phaser magnitude. So we think that that would be a good way to characterize circadian disruption in the field. And in fact, we looked at the nurses' health study data that we had, and we looked at nurses that were day shift, worked zero numbers of night, and then those that worked one, two, three, four, and five. And what we noted was that as you increase the number of nights work, you actually increase your circadian disruption. In other words, you reduce your phaser magnitude. The other point I want to make is that we may be exposed to too little light during the day. These are data that we collected with different groups of people, uh, young adults, teachers, eighth graders, day shift nurses, and rotating shift nurses. And we split the data into their morning and their evening circadian stimulus. And morning was four hours um, after they woke up. Evening was four hours prior to going to bed. And what you can see here, if you consider a threshold for activation of the circadian system as a 0.1, and the half saturation would be 0.35, the majority of the people are getting very, very, very low light levels during the day close to 0.1 for the morning and a lot less than 0.1 for the evening. So nobody's even that close to 0.3, okay? And that corroborates with the work we're doing with the General Service Administration uh, where we collected data in office workers uh, during the daytime and we looked at their morning and their daytime light exposures. And what we found is we split the data into those that received a circadian stimulus of 0.3 or higher or less than 0.15, which would be close to threshold. The 0.3 would, would be about half max saturation. And we saw that the, those receiving higher circadian stimulation were more entrained. Uh, they had less sleep onset latency. They were reporting being less depressed they were reporting having better sleep quality based on the PSQI, which is the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, as well as the Promise T score. So basically, more light during the day is leading to better sleep at night and less depression in this office worker population. The last point I want to make is not just about blue light, okay? 
we are showing that red light, which does not affect melatonin and does not affect circadian phase, have a strong alerting effect. The, the graph on the left is um, EEG on the alpha power, so there's a reduction in alpha power, which means a reduction in sleepiness when you're exposed to red light, as well as an, a reduction in reaction time, so people are reacting faster. We're currently doing work with NIOSH where we, we're implementing red light in shift workers, which may be a good solution because you're not suppressing their melatonin with red light, but you are increasing um, their alertness, which is what you want. So just to summarize with what we know, um, the light stim we need, um, what we, we do need to know is we do need to know the light stimulus. We need to know light level, spectrum, timing, duration, spatial distribution, and photic history. Remember, we need to know total light exposures, not just light at night. We need to consider when, or carefully when using satellite images because they may not be good surrogates for measuring circadian light. And we need to consider the daytime light exposures that may be too low in buildings. Uh, we need to measure the level of circadian disruption in the field. We need to understand the differences between humans and animal models when translating the research. And we need to remember that it's not just about the blue light and melatonin suppression. So it's really about all the light that we're being exposed to. And just as a final thought, and we talked a lot about that in the workshop we had with NIHS last year, is that it may be that light at night is an enabler for circadian disruption, so it may not have a direct impact on melatonin, but it allows you to disrupt yourself. For example, if you're reading your iPad, playing on your phones at night, you may dim it down, you may filter it out, it's not going to suppress your melatonin, but you're still staying awake and you're still curtailing sleep. So it may be that this indirect effect is something that is associated, obviously, with behavior. So we may be thinking about controlling and educating people about uh, what we shouldn't be doing. Finally, um, I'm going to quickly cover what we think we need to know to move the field forward. So as a first step, and as I mentioned, we need to characterize circadian light for humans and for animal models. I think we need to develop and use instruments that will measure circadian light dark levels and activity rest patterns for humans in the field, quantify circadian entrainment and disruption in the field, and then build a bridge between actual human conditions, what we're measuring in the field, into animal models in the lab, and link that circadian disruption to metric, which in our case we're using phaser analysis to health outcomes, and perhaps study light-dark patterns that would minimize disruption or shift work schedules that would minimize disruption. So as a first step, um, we have uh, developed a calculator that you can use with the spectral power distribution of the light source, the light levels, and you can calculate the circadian stimulus. So that's something that we hope can help people with understanding what the stimulus is. Um, we have also um, proposed a spectral um, sensitivity function for how nocturnal animals, and in particular this is for mice, C57 black mice, how they respond to light. And they do have a peak around 500 nanometers. They also have a UV cone, so all these things need to be taken into account, including their absolute sensitivity to light. Um, for the second step is we need to start using uh, calibrated field instruments. Uh, I think that the decimeter was developed for that, for research tools. Obviously, not everybody wants to wear devices, so maybe one of the things that need to be done is really calibrating the device so that if, for example, if you want to do questionnaires, you do a calibration of these questionnaires by using the devices first. And actually, we're doing that with the American Cancer Society. We're calibrating some of their questionnaires before they send out to a large group of people. Um, Quantify circadian entrainment and disruption in the field. We have been using phaser, uh, in particular phaser magnitude. So a larger magnitude means a person is more entrained, and that's very easily measured in the field. You measure light dark, you measure rest activity patterns, and you can calculate those cross-correlations. There has been other work done 
suggesting other types of way of calculating circadian disruption in the field. That's a, a paper that was recently published, uh, Till Ronenberg from Germany, suggesting what he called compositive phase deviation plots, where you can characterize those that are at more or less external ex strain or more or less circadian disruption. So again, this is calculated with actigraphy and it can be done easily. The next step is to build that bridge. And the first thing we need to do to build the bridge is to start developing cage lighting systems that deliver more biologically meaningful light to animals. We are giving these animals too bright light and we don't really know what the consequences of that are for the research. And if we wanted to mimic, we need to be able to give them similar light to what we humans are being exposed to in our natural environment. Um, to build that bridge, we have started working on collecting some data, and these are data we collected with um, animals and the nurses' health study. We looked at phaser magnitudes. The left graph in the bottom looks at night shifts work uh, zero, which is daytime, one or three nights worked. And then the graph on the right is using animal models where we collect, use the data from the decimeter in humans. We converted that into uh, biologically meaningful light to the animals, and we expose the animals to similar light-dark patterns as the nurses did, and we show that you have a very similar relationship in terms of phaser magnitude for the animal and for the nurses. So the way we think we should do and work to try to tease out some of the effects of circadian disruption on health is reinforce that link between circadian disruption and health outcomes from epidemiology using controlled animal studies. So we're proposing to use phasers as sort of that bridge where we collect that in the field, we bring it into the animal model, and we see how that affects the animal. And we actually started doing that. Uh, this was one study we just published where we, we looked at glucose levels. We exposed the animals to a day shift schedule, a one-night rotating shift schedule, and a three-night rotating shift schedule, mimicking what nurses would be exposed to. And we collected glucose levels. And then we relate those glucose levels to phaser magnitudes. And we did see a correlation between um, phase or magnitude. So as you increase the number of rotating shift nights, you increase um, the, the, you decrease your phase or magnitude and you also um, increase your glucose area under the curve. So in other words, you become more diabetic with more nights worked and you have lower phase or magnitude. So we're, we're able to start doing that bridge, but this is just a starting point. Um, finally, um, what do all this have to do with the exposome? So bringing it all back to exposome, uh, what we think we need to start doing as a, a scientific community is really start using our ability to measure and the apps that we're now seeing out there. And we've been working with developing an app that can write a prescription to a person uh, based on their light exposure. So you have a sensor. Um, the sensor would measure your light exposure, would talk to an app that has a model of human circadian entrainment. That app would calculate when you need light and when you don't need light. And the idea is that that app can perhaps talk to um, your, your lighting in your home or lighting in your cubicle lighting in your office, and it can be changing so that it's delivering the best light you can to maintain or the best light you need to maintain entrainment. Uh, the, the lighting technology is there now. Um, you can change the lighting very easily. Um, you have the technology. I think it's just a matter of us um, validating this whole app and uh, whole system and moving that forward. So finally, uh, I would like everyone to consider adding light measurements to your cohort. Um, if, not, if that's not possible, at least consider calibrating your subjective scales and instruments. 
similar to what the American Cancer Society is doing with us. Consider individual differences in their behaviors in your analysis. For example, teenagers are more sensitive to light at night for acute melatonin suppression, and they use their self-luminous display close to their eyes in the hours before bed. So remember, you have to think about who you're talking to and who, what are people doing and how can we also control the behavior. Consider spe species-specific differences when translating results from animal models to humans. And be careful when translating laboratory results to real-life applications. We tend to be much more sensitized in lab. When it comes to real-life applications, we have perhaps less sensitivity to light. So I think doing these field studies and translating what we know from the lab to the field studies is very important. I do want to acknowledge our project sponsors. Uh, we have been very fortunate with, uh, especially NIH, Office of Naval Research, uh, GSA. Uh, they have allowed us to collect all these data and do all these, these uh, very interesting stuff, and obviously organizers of the event and my colleagues at the Lighting Research Center. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana, for the wonderful presentation.